Well, good afternoon. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this special event hosted by the Archery Institute to explore cyber regulatory harmonization. My name is Brandon Pugh, and I'm the director of R Street Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats team. Uh, for those not familiar, the R Street Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank. Our mission is to engage in policy research and outreach, promote free markets, and limited effective government. So, cyber policy is a key focus for our team uh, in terms of balancing the need to increase cybersecurity with the impact it might have on innovation and industry. Uh, but a specific area under this effort is cyber regulatory harmonization. We welcome efforts that seek to improve the current cyber regulatory landscape because we believe it's complex with overlapping and often inconsistent regulations across international, federal, state, and local levels. This leads to compliance challenges and even cybersecurity vulnerabilities in some cases. Um, our team spent months on a report that we released just last month, which analyzed responses to the Office of the National Cyber Director's RFI on cyber regulatory harmonization using machine learning and natural language processing. Uh, a link to the report will be available in the chat for those that are watching live. Uh, and for those watching later, it'll be available at rstreet.org. We found that most respondents desire to consolidate requirements under fewer bodies, preferred sector-specific approaches over a one-size-fits-all approach, and had concerns over overly prescriptive regulations that might divert resources from security. There's also a need identified for greater clarity around the definition and goal of regulatory harmonization in terms of whether there should be regulation eliminated, a common set of baselines, or even reciprocity. Um, R Street then offered recommendations for the path forward, as well as around clarifying intent, areas for further analysis, obtaining buy-in from federal entities, and the role of a coordinating body. So today, we have an opportunity to explore the work that has occurred to date, both in Capitol Hill and in the administration, notably by ONCD, and discuss next steps. In a moment, we'll have keynote remarks by Senator Gary Peters, followed by a great panel uh, moderated by my colleague, Heyman Long. And uh, I have to note, Heyman was an author of the report I previously mentioned uh, and did an exceptional job. There will also be an opportunity for audience question and answer during the panel, so feel free to put them in the chat throughout uh, or, at, or at the end. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Senator Gary Peters to provide pre-recorded opening remarks. Senator Peters represents the state of Michigan. Um, and notably for today's talk, he also serves as the chairman of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Cybersecurity and regulatory harmonization in particular have been key priorities for him, as evidenced by the hearing of the topic that he chaired last month and action just today. So now without further ado, Senator Peters. Hello, I'm U.S. Senator Gary Peters, and I'm honored to join you at this important event. And I want to thank the R Street Institute for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. And I appreciate your ongoing dedication to improving our nation's cybersecurity landscape. As you know, some American regulators have moved quickly to set standards for cybersecurity and digital safety in recent years. And while regulations are crucial to improving our nation's cybersecurity posture, we must ensure that these guidelines are coordinated, they're effective, and efficient to truly serve their purpose. We cannot afford a patchwork approach to our cybersecurity defenses, which is why I've introduced the Streamlining Federal Cybersecurity Regulations Act with Senator Langford. This legislation would establish an interagency harmonization committee within the office of the National Cyber Director, which would allow us to bring all regulators to the table and ensure that we produce real outcomes that can help coordinate our cybersecurity approach across the federal government. This long-term streamlining and harmonization work is absolutely important not just for federal agencies, but also for independent regulatory agencies too. By including independent agencies in this process, we can ensure that all sectors are aligned in their approach to digital security. So thank you. Thank you again for being here today. And I look forward to continuing to work alongside you as we create a more secure and effective cybersecurity framework for America. 
Thank you, Senator Peters, for that insightful keynote. Your perspectives on the importance of having a coordinated approach to strengthening our cybersecurity landscape sets the perfect stage for our discussion today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heyman Wong, and I'm honored to moderate this panel for on cybersecurity regulatory harmonization. I'm joined here today by an esteemed group of experts to discuss the goal of cyber regulatory harmonization and how we should be moving how should we how, how we should be moving for it. To start, I'd like to give each of our panelists a minute or two to introduce themselves and also share a little bit more about their background and their work. As each panelist is, is introducing themselves, we'll also share an extended bio in the chat for you all to read. I'll now turn the mic over to Elizabeth Irwin first, followed by Jason Healy, and last but certainly not least, Vincent Massey. So Elizabeth, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Heyman, and thank you all for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Irwin. I am Director for Cyber Policy and Programs here at the Office of the National Cyber Director at the White House. Um, I've been with ONCD for roughly two years and came here from the Treasury Department where I was in the Office of Cybersecurity and Critical Infrastructure Protection. So I come from the financial services sector background, which as I'm sure some of you on the call are very familiar with, is a very highly regulated industry in general, and particularly with regards to cybersecurity. Here at ONCD, my portfolio includes critical infrastructure and specifically leading our regulatory harmonization initiative, which we'll talk more about in a second. Um, I have been the lead for our request for information effort, um, which again, we'll get into in the details, but I do wanna start off by saying that if you or your organization submitted a response to our RFI, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, and we very much value the perspectives that were shared. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation today and glad to hand it back to you, Heyman. Thanks, Elizabeth, welcome. We'll turn it over to Jason Healy next. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm Jason Healy. I'm Senior Research Scholar at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. Let me start with Go Team USA, right? It's so easy sometimes to, to think about all the stuff that divides us, but it's been great to see, see uh, Team USA go. So I started to get involved in cyber, regula race, cyber regulation and harmonization while I was um, at ONCD as part of the drafting team. Much of the initial work that went into the strategy talk about a defensible cyberspace and achieving leverage came from work we did at Columbia University's School of International Public Affairs, our New York um, uh, uh, Cyber Task Force. And um, before that, um, I was at the White House the first time in 2003, 2005. I helped set up the, the Department of Defense's first cyber command um, back in 1998 and spent some time at Goldman Sachs, Vice Chairman of the FSI SAC, and a range of other roles. And thank you so much for having us today. Welcome, Jason. And last but certainly not least, I'll turn it over to Vincent Mosi. Good afternoon, everyone. Brendan, thanks very much for having uh, the chamber and me uh, as part of the program. I mean, thank you for organizing this great panel and panelists. Thanks and looking forward to the discussion today. I'm Vince Mosi, Vice President for Cyber Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington, D.C. Um, we're a large trade association representing the interests of the business community broadly um, before governments here in the United States and across the globe. We're pleased to contribute to Elizabeth's and the ONCD RFI framework. Um, that was a critically important priority um, for our member companies on evaluating and continuing to look at the increasingly fragmented uh, landscape of cybersecurity regulations. Secondly, opportunities and challenges with creating mutual recognition or reciprocity agreements and where we can drive this into policy and really implement change um, over the short and the long term. And delighted to be joined um, also with Senator Peters and their important legislation um, that Congress is currently considering um, to really drive additional harmonization at the federal level as well. So thanks very much and looking forward to the discussion today. Welcome, Vince. So we have a lot to get into today, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, drawing from your current roles, expertise, and background, which you all have shared a little bit about in your introduction so far, how do you define cybersecurity regulatory harmonization? What is its primary goal? 
and why is it relevant and important to you today? So that is a bit of a three-part question. So feel free to take your time um, and really, you know, express all of your thoughts and any other perspectives that you might have. We'll go ahead and start with Elizabeth first, and in the same order, we'll go with Jason after that, and last but not least, Vincent. Elizabeth, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks, Damon. So, you know, in terms of ONCD's view on this, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, ONCD developed and published the President's National Cybersecurity Strategy in March of 2023 and released its accompanying implementation plan in July of last year. Shortly thereafter, uh, we published the request for information that you Looks like we have a bit of a public. delay from Elizabeth, so we'll go ahead and turn to Jason in the meantime, and we'll circle back to Elizabeth as um, the internet section allows. Um, okay, sure. I was able to hear Elizabeth, Elizabeth well there, so hopefully we're able to get that worked out. Um, so as I said, I, I started on this work when uh, I was in ONCD, and we were writing terms into the strategy of saying, you know, not just that we want to do important things like harmonize, um, but that we wanted regulations to be um, uh, non-duplicative. We wanted them to be performance-based. We wanted to uh, ensure that they were tailored. Um, and I was looking through these, you know, the academic in me, I've, I've generally been a practitioner, a policymaker, but, you know, Columbia has been about 10 years now. And I started saying, well, what do these words mean? Like, like, I don't know for someone that's been in this field, what some of these terms mean. Um, you know, what does what is performance-based um, uh, regulations, for example? Um, and as I started to dive in, I really didn't see a lot of the, the things that I would expect to see. So for example, if the US government is going to tell Microsoft they can't buy Blizzard, right? If we're gonna block a merge, uh, an acquisition, Right. There's a legal theory and economic theory in the facts of the case. And so I was saying, all right, well, we're saying we want performance based or we want these other areas. I, I was looking and saying, all right, well, where's the homework that we've done on that? And no doubt it's the right kinds of things to do. But I said, all right, well, let's let's dive in. Right. We need to make sure we're getting our homework. And so fortunately, the ONC team was very OMCD team was very supportive. Um, and to start to dive in on, on, on these things, to look at what's been out there in regulatory theory, in regulation for the other sectors and saying, good, what can we grab in that's useful for us when we're looking at cybersecurity? Um, so that's, um, so for example, if we're saying we want regulation to be performance-based, that means performance-based is micro ends. It's very specific. And we're saying the outcome that the regulators actually want. In cybersecurity, we only actually have one real performance-based metric. It's a recovery time objectives, right? When the financial regulators in 2003 said, we want a three hour, we want you to recover um, uh, hopefully within, I think, two hours, um, that's performance-based. If we want harmonized regulations, generally you want management-based or perform, um, um, uh, you want management-based kinds of regulations. Um, where you're saying not recover in three, uh, three or two hours, but recover in a timely manner, because that's easier for regulators to decide on. We're allowing the regulated entities to make up um, their own minds of how they can deliver the outcomes that the regulators want. We've also been looking at drivers of disharmony. We all say we want harmony, but we end up in disharmony. How does that actually happen? What is it that we're trying to fix? Why is it we keep saying we want harmony and we keep ending up in the other direction? Unless we understand the drivers, we're not gonna get there. I'm gonna hold off on all that. We can do a follow-up, but I wanna I want hear from the others and see if we can bring Elizabeth in. Thank you, Jay. Sorry about that earlier, Elizabeth, go ahead. No, I apologize. We were having unfortunate network lag here at the White House. Um, I believe where I left off and Came in flag if you can't hear me. Um, but I believe where I left off is that, you know, the RFI, um, we had introduced that last summer. Again, thank you if you responded to that. And this, the whole point of this was for us to collect perspectives from, yes, primarily regulated entities, as they're the ones who are really incurring all of the activity associated with it. But also we heard from many other stakeholders as well at the state and local level, um, trade associations, 
uh, Vince and his team put together a really helpful and insightful response uh, on behalf of the chamber and others, including some international stakeholders as well. So all of that was the start of our regulatory harmonization initiative, which if you've seen the National Cybersecurity Strategy Implementation Plan, then you know that that is part of Pillar 1, defending critical infrastructure, because that is our ultimate goal here at ONCD. That's how we're approaching regulatory harmonization with the broader intent that if you can harmonize this better, if you can streamline cybersecurity regulation against a minimum baseline set of cybersecurity requirements that you can mitigate cross-sector risk. That's our thesis. That's the approach we're taking. Um, and so that is what brought us through the RFI, and we released our summary report on the RFI last month uh, in just in advance of our Assistant National Cyber Director for Cyber Policy and Programs, Nick Leiserson, testifying before the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee on this issue um, in advance of them introducing their legislation. So I'll stop there, mindful of the time, um, but that's kind of where we are um, up to this point. Thanks for that very helpful overview, Elizabeth. I know you guys have done a lot, so it's difficult to cram into just a minute or two, but I'm sure we'll get back to all of the details in just a little bit here. And last but not least, Vince would love to hear from you as well. Yeah, thanks. I think, you know, from the Chamber's perspective, we look at the, the, the concept of regulatory harmonization as a function of, of two principal work streams. Um, one on cyber incident reporting harmonization, and really want to acknowledge um, all of the leaders in Congress, the administration that pushed, pushed through the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act. That is a really good baseline around which harmonization, mutual recognition, and reciprocity agreements and can be built off of, and including, in particular, the work um, led by DHS hacking through the Cyber Incident Reporting Council to highlight opportunities for both alignment and then divergent, and some of the successive work plans that have flowed out from there. But like body of work number one through the chamber's lens is on cyber incident reporting harmonization work. Body area number two for us is around core cybersecurity baseline requirements. And what's the, the chamber's end objective here? It's a coherent, non-fragmented, harmonious um, regulatory framework. We're not saying do less, do less, not we understand that governments have a responsible for the national and economic security of their jurisdiction, for the safe and efficient operations of critical infrastructure. Business shares those end state and end objectives. Help us do this in a manner in which is coherent um, and reduces fragmentation, reduces burden, cost and efficiencies. The best way for us to do that is standards-based compliance work using standards like NIST, ISO, ISA, IEC, uh, ISA um, as the core around which regulations are based. That inevitably will lead to um, mutual recognition in areas of, of more coherent approaches. Thanks, Finn. So building on the perspective that you, you and all of the other panelists kind of laid out there just now, could you speak to some of the primary benefits of achieving cybersecurity regulatory harmonization for both public and private sectors from your perspective? And after you, we'll kind of go backwards through the line and we'll go to Jay next and end with Elizabeth there. Thank you. I think one of the, the most common things that we, that we hear from our members is, you know, help us comply once. Like, it is very expensive to do, you know, certifications against an ISO standard or get certified against a um, against the using and assessing against using the NIST cybersecurity framework, or very expensive to go through a FedRAMP authorization um, just to get onto um, the, the 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 platform. So help us do this in an efficient, cost-effective manner in a way that we can show our work. The business can show its cybersecurity certification work uh, to regulators around around the globe. You know, as an as an area of of potential alignment, you know, we look at Europe where they have core critical infrastructure requirements, increasingly so after the passage of NIT NIS to the Network and Information Systems Directive 2.0, which expands upon 1.0, which created certain security measures requirements for, for critical infrastructure 
we at the chamber and many others were very influential in going to to capitals around the globe and saying, here's the framework, here's the NIST cybersecurity framework. This is what good looks like in our playbook. Help us get to using this as a means of achieving your security measures requirements at NIS-1 and hopefully through NIS-2 as it comes into force and effect in October across the European Union. It's that kind of work that we think, that standards-based compliance work that helps to reduce burdens for companies like in the financial services sector that have to meet regulatory requirements in 100 plus jurisdictions that are increasingly looking at reporting requirements that diverge in both the number of incidents that have to be reported, the types of incidents that have to be reported, the timelines in which the reported requirements um, have to be delivered to government. So I think that's, that's how we approach um, harmonization going forward. Thanks, Vince. Whenever you're ready, Jay. Yeah, great. And I just love hearing all the work that everybody is doing in, in this space. Um, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different direction because um, it's been, I came across a quote um, a while back that said we need to, security cannot be added by retrofit. It must be included by design, right? We know that that's not, that secure by design isn't the point of, of today's session, but that quote was actually from 1972. So we've known for 50 years that we were supposed to be doing secure by design and we didn't do it. And we've got a bunch of other quotes from the 1970s that talk about how the attacker has a lot of the advantages and we need to struggle. And so a lot of my work has been saying, all right, what can we do to try and turn that around? And that's what the National Cybersecurity Strategy picked up. Right? It says we need to break these five decades. And one of the reasons we've failed is we've is because we tend to look for controls or put things in place that are more expensive for us to implement than it is for the adversaries to bypass. So I put regulatory harmonization and all the great things that Vince just talked about in that structure, right? For too long, we've been putting this burden of, of duplicative and often super ineffective regulations that are compliance, checklist, inefficient, and ineffective for the companies putting this massive burden, giving this insecure systems, and then blaming them when they can't do it well and having incredible reporting um, um, and requirements for security. So that's why I really associated with how Vince put that, right? If we can buy down, if we can bring down those costs, if we can have the phrases that, that Elizabeth and Vince said, right? If we can have this good set of harmonized, effective standards that they can do once, report simply, then we're meeting what the government needs. We can meet the public policy purpose for which we're doing this, which is to buy down cybersecurity risk that impacts the rest of us at a lower cost. And we can maybe finally start turning this around so that the defenders are able to join. And that's what I like about the strategy. They keep hitting these points. Where's the smallest turn of the public policy screwdriver that can give us these largest impacts and regulatory harmonization if it's right in there? Thank you, Jay. Elizabeth, whenever you're ready. Yeah, so you know, how does ONCD view what the benefits of harmonization are? We received 86 responses to the RFI, and if there was one thing that came up in every single response, it was the words compliance burden to a team. No matter the sector, no matter the size of the organization of the respondent, it was compliance burden. That we heard that very loud and clear. Um, and sadly, we anticipated that, <laughs> uh, which was part of the reason that we're attempting this work. It's a compliance burden for certainly the regulated entities, right? The proliferation of regulations that in some instances are duplicative, in other instances may actually be conflicting. So the challenge inherent in it being an organization having one, in many cases, multiple regulators across multiple jurisdictions, as Vince alluded to, and how do you deconflict all of that? And you're spending inordinate time, amounts of time focused on that rather than patch management, right? Because your IT team is dealing with filling out all the paperwork for your regulator and not dealing with vulnerability management, not focused on other cybersecurity activities and improving one's cybersecurity posture. So we heard that very loud and clear. 
The flip side as well, though, in our conversations with the regulatory community itself is that they too have a side of that compliance burden coin. As they are, rightly so, looking to manage cybersecurity risk within their sectors, that though requires them to spend a lot of time as well as the regulator accounting for that, whether it's through examination, whether it's through third-party certification, however that particular sector does regulate for cybersecurity. And at ONCD, our view is that is time, if we can establish a minimum of floor, if you will, for what is good cybersecurity across all critical infrastructure sectors, that frees of you as a regulator to focus on what we call sector-specific risk, right? The unique risks inherent to you if you are a financial institution or if you are a nuclear power plant or a water treatment plant, right? You have sector-specific risks that if you're an energy, aren't necessarily applicable to telecoms. And if you are the regulators for energy, then it's a better use of your time because regulators themselves have limited resources to focus your supervisory and oversight responsibilities on that sector specific issue. So that's how we view uh, the desired end state of regulatory harmonization is that it would reduce the burden on both sides, the regulated entities and the regulators themselves. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think each of you gave a great overview, I think, of the primary benefits around cybersecurity regulatory harmonization. And to Elizabeth's point, right, there's always kind of a flip side of it as well. So without, you know, harping, I guess, on all of the what skeptics might say around regulatory harmonization, there is kind of a question mark, I guess, that some people have when they immediately think of the word harmonization. And that is, you know, how do we ensure that there is alignment between stakeholders on the definition, as well as the goals of cybersecurity regulatory harmonization? Hearing from each of the three of you, each of you guys are coming at it at slightly different angles, even, if, even though there is some common agreement in what each of you guys just shared. So based on that kind of framing, um, I want to turn it over to Jay first to kind of chime in here on any thoughts or responses you have in, you know, towards that question. And then we'll go towards Vince and end with Elizabeth as well. So Great. whenever you're ready, Jay. Awesome. Thank I'm ready now. Um, and you can tell I'm a frameworks guy, right? And Vince had mentioned frameworks, but I suspect we mean slightly different things when we're talking about frameworks and both are needed. I'm a like, I like conceptual frameworks to start with. Um, that's different from like the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is which is a structured way of thinking about it. Um, uh, for example, like what I said in my earlier comments, when we say performance based, that is micro ends. That's different from what most regulated entities want. They tend to want things that are more management based, which are macro means. Big picture, right? The regulator doesn't set out two hours. No, it sets out big picture kinds of stuff. Um, and it doesn't say the specific ends. It says that you need to set up a management process to figure out how you get there. Um, so as we go through and we start looking at the new regulations that are coming out, right? What is the specific public purposes that we're thinking about doing this? Um, actually, I'm gonna start even farther back. What I would love to see our regulatory process do that says, okay, for, um, for each area, what are the actual market failures we're trying to fix? Because the United States government doesn't just regulate willy-nilly, right? We regulate because we think there's a market failure. And market failure is broad, right? It's not an Adam Smith definition. Like it's the it's where the market itself isn't delivering the public policy outcomes we want. And that could be the public policy outcomes for a range of things. Um, housing is too expensive here in New York City, or it's too easy, or it's too hard to have firearms, or the government isn't understanding what's happened in cybersecurity and needs to, to get told, right? So that last one, we're, here we're talking about two different market failures, like Vin, what Vincent mentioned. We need reporting. Why do we need reporting? Because there's an information asymmetry between the companies that have been affected and what the government needs to know um, for critical infrastructure protection, colonial pipeline, what investors need to know, um, what insurance companies and others might need to know so we can underwrite um, properly, um, what customers need to know, right? Those are four different areas that we have for information asymmetry. We also have negative externalities, and that's why we want minimum baseline cybersecurity requirements and tailored so that a company can't accept the risk that they then impose on others. 
So what I'd like is that we go through and we say for each one of those market failures, which sector has which failures? Um, for each of those kind of failures, what's in our public policy toolkit to handle each? And that will help us dive in. And we go through and we say, all right, these regulations um, that we currently have are micro ends and we need to move them down and make sure they're more management based. Um, uh, which disharmonies are we are we looking at? And right, so it's just a little bit of conceptual framework that we lay on top of this so that we're talking about the same things. Because I bet we had different stakeholders saying they wanted performance-based regulations and I suspect when we were drafting the National Cybersecurity Strategy, we had people that had very different thoughts about what performance-based regulations actually meant. So if we wanna harmonize, align those public policy purposes with the right means, which is tend, gonna be things like management-based, um, and be clear that we're actually closing that harmonized against the market failures we're trying to hit. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, Vince? Yeah, so I think, you know, your question on definitions, I want to just drive back to kind of the standards based compliance work that I mentioned at the top of the program. You know, NIST is a authoritative source as a standards development agency that is internationally recognized, accredited by ANSI to you know, promulgate standards that our organizations, that our businesses use with some frequency. Um, to meet government and regulatory expectations for core security requirements. On the definition side, like certainly the, you know, this framework is a great framework, but let me just speak on like product level cybersecurity. So NISTRS 8259 um, or ISA uh, IEC 6443 or ISO 27-103 um, are all great product specific cybersecurity baseline requirements that include a common lexicon um, that are increasingly used um, across the globe um, to level up products to a certain cybersecurity standard, um, whether that's a security right and design standard, whether that's a core baseline requirement, whether that is a life cycle um, requirement, each one of these individual standards has this common lexicon. So I think, you know, to your question on how do we drive, you know, international, national alignment on it, it is reason regulators experience understanding with some of these technical standards to understand their virtue and being able to use them to in one setting um, and allow the scalability in multiple different jurisdictions. You know, better understanding of standards work um, will inform better public policy and mutual recognition and harmonization here and abroad. Thanks for sharing those insights, Vince. Elizabeth? Yeah, I think Vince uh, helpfully teed up a lot of really important points that I would just like to jump in on. So a lot of ONCD's work to date and, and going forward as well on regulatory harmonization has been with the Cybersecurity Forum for Independent and Executive Branch Regulators, which is currently chaired by the Federal Communications Commission. And what's been really helpful in that, it brings together roughly 30 federal regulatory agencies, is to have those exact conversations that Vince alluded to about things like a common shared lexicon. Because it's really challenging to create cross-sector applicable minimum regulatory requirements if not everyone's even agreeing on what the definition of this particular thing is, right, in a cybersecurity context. And so as regulations have been developed over the years, and arguably in many cases within sector-specific silos, that work has not been done or not been done to its full potential. And so that's an effort that we've been working on with FCC in its leadership position and alongside the forum members to have that conversation with the regulatory bodies themselves and say, can we all agree on what these common definitions are to build toward a model framework that could be applicable across multiple sectors? It is, it's boring work to a lot of folks, right? But it is necessary foundational work that admittedly does take a long time when you're getting multiple different perspectives on it. Um, but we are pleased with that progress and it's a really helpful, important step forward to the broader long-term goal, right, of cross-sector harmonization. But starting to get regulators to um, come to a mutually understood and agreed upon view, if you will, 
of the landscape and therefore how can they approach it in a collaborative and widely adopted consensus approach. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. So, so far in the conversation, we've kind of laid out the framework or kind of an overview of what the cybersecurity regulatory harmonization effort is, some of the primary benefits and identified, you know, some of the challenges that might exist or questions that might surround how we would align between stakeholders on the definition and goals of cybersecurity regulatory harmonization. So I wanted to reserve a good amount of the time here, I'll be as limited as it is, to really think about how we move forward and kind of the next steps that come around. So as we started this conversation with the keynote by Senator Peters, he obviously kind of touched on the Streamlining Federal Cybersecurity Regulations Act, which obviously he had a very heavy role in introducing and drafting up as well. Um, I'd love to get your views on its potential impact on advancing cybersecurity regulatory harmonization efforts, and also what specific provisions, if any, that you find most promising within it. So I'll go ahead and kick it over to Vince first, and then we'll go to Jay and end with Elizabeth here. Sure. Uh, happy to start. So, you know, first of all, really want to commend Senator Peters and Senator Langford for picking up um, and moving forward um, pretty aggressively. I mean, some 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 might say like, hey, it's an election year. Like, why why even bother like trying to get this done? But this is a really important body of work um, for the business community, and especially as we look at kind of the broader like regulatory environment that businesses have had to operate and comply with for the last three years. The bill's objective as we see it is to create a common sense, comprehensive, coherent regulatory framework and does that by a you know an initial step of organizing a council. Now the question we get all the time is like why this council versus the existing structure like what's different? And I think what is different is this is led at the White House. The White House is the convener of this. We have to be able to organize and importantly, most critically, independent agencies who we've seen over the last several years promulgate uh, additional regulations that are somewhat out of step, you know, a la SEC, you know, cyber incident reporting, um, one of which was highlighted um, uh, by the CERC report, which I mentioned at the top of the program as being one of the uh, federally incoherent um, or, or duplicative reporting requirements, especially when we have this top line structure of CERCIA. So one, I think this council is really important. On the front end, looking at forthcoming regulations, existing regulations, developing a framework for um, review um, and looking for areas of harmonization. And then the second most important part um, being that it has a pilot program where there can be specific pilots that are initiated, and whether that's on a sector by sector basis, whether that's on a, um, on a core security measures requirement, whether that is on OT across, you know, regulated owner operators or water utilities, you know, I think we, we have an agnostic view, but driving actual progress is critically important. That output is, is super important for, for the chamber and our members. We don't want to just have another report. We feel like we've all done a, a good bit of, of reporting. Um, let's let's move this into to operation. And I think the Harmonization Council offers that next step forward in an enduring body of work, regardless of the administration. You know, we're really optimistic that we can get this done by the end of the year. And you know, congratulate the HISGAC team on the markup earlier today. Um, and look forward to continuing the discussions with House OGC and CHS on potentially companion legislation um, to achieve a hopefully a bill by the end of the year. That's wonderful. Thanks, Vince. Um, Jay, whenever you're ready. Um, actually, do you mind if I defer to Elizabeth? Because I suspect her comments are going to follow very closely to Vince's, and I, I suspect she's going to be smarter on this than me. So I'd like to hear her next, if you don't mind, Hammond. No, of course. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thanks, Jay, and you would be right. Um, you know, I think Vince covered it mostly, so I won't belabor the point except to say that a key part of the proposed legislation, as Vince mentioned, is that it scopes in the independent regulatory commissions. All of ONCD's efforts to date have been, as I mentioned, through the Cybersecurity Regulators Forum, which, as many of you probably know, is entirely voluntary, or as we like to say, it's a coalition of the willing. 
and they're great. And they've done, you know, they've been moving the ball down the field to the best of their ability. But if your goal is to achieve cross-sector harmonization, then you need everyone at the table. That's our perspective. And that includes, therefore, the independent regulatory commissions who have independence and rightly so. Um, but it would bring to the table them for this conversation specifically scoped to cybersecurity, right? It wouldn't touch on any other form of regulation. And so that I think is what is a particularly helpful part about Senator Peters' proposed approach is the inclusion of the independent regulatory commissions because absent them, as you all know, they cover a wide swath, right, of the regulatory environment. If you are developing, if this committee were to develop a model framework absent their perspectives absent their expertise, then it would be far less successful and uh, the implementation of that would be far more difficult. If, if I can build on, the, on those points, and just especially for the folks that are listening in, maybe don't follow it as closely as, as, as Vince and Elizabeth have, but some of the recommendations that have come out of presidential advisory committees have set, or DHS advisory committees, have said um, this Office of Regulatory Harmonization should be at CISA. Um, or you know, in the Department of Homeland Security. And I think the three of us are agreeing that like CISA might have a role in operationally harmonizing, for example, like um, you know, particular, you know, on, on particular um, standards, perhaps. But when it comes down to it, we're talking about different departments that have secretaries um, or, or commissioners that report directly to the president, you know, either directly or they're actually independent. And that kind of coordination really needs to come from the White House. Um, that, that can't come from a, a department, much less an agency, at that higher level to really force things through. At the end of the day, you need to be able to go to the chief of staff. You need to be able to go to the president um, and say, or the deputies committee, like, and, hey, here's what we're trying to do. Who's on, who's on board? And that's going to be too difficult to do at, at the role of agency. So I, I really associate myself with the comments that have come before. Um, I would like to go a little bit further when it comes to ONCD. Um, because this isn't just about harmonization. Because um, to me, harmonization is great, but how do we even know that we're harmonizing on the most effective regulations? So, so to me, regulatory effectiveness is at least as important as it is harmonization. Um, ONCD needs to not only oversee harmonization, but the imp other th important things that are in the strategy. Li potentially liability for software manufacturers. Um, this post facto in enforcement, right? Having SEC going after personally prosecuting the CISO of solar winds when CISOs are generally the, the champions of security within the organization. And so here we're seeing this disharmony between most of the most of the US government saying it's not an IT thing, like cyber risk isn't an IT thing. It belongs to the board of directors. It belongs to the CEO. And then having the SEC go personally after only the CISO. So I think there's a range of things that ONCD could have an organization. I would even argue that there should be a separate assistant national cyber director just to handle regulatory issues. This is the most, regulation is the most important thing, politically sensitive thing that I would say we have ever tried in cybersecurity as a government. Um, it's much more politically sensitive and harder than fixing workforce. And yet we have a separate workforce strategy and a separate office an ANCD4 workforce. If this administration or the next one doesn't fix, fix workforce, it's going to suck, but we're going to have another chance. If ONCD and the White House blows regulation, we might never get another chance, or might maybe not for another 20 years. And so I'd really like to see us um, ONCD put in more, including its own dedicated substrategy. Right, The kinds of things we're talking about here, harmonization, liability for software manufacturers, mandatory reporting. We need a strategy and it needs to be the principals and deputies of the National Security Council and the National Economic Council that approve that. So obviously that's not going to happen between now and November, but hopefully whoever is going to be president um, come January um, will have that work done uh, started from the ONCD. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. So one 
persisting question around, you know, the details around moving forward and next steps is how the ONCD plans to establish baselines for cybersecurity regulatory harmonization and what role reciprocity will play in that process. And more specifically, does the ONCD envision these standards being mandatory or voluntary? So Elizabeth, I'd like to direct that question to you. And then obviously, Jay and Vince, if there's anything follow up that you guys would like to add on to anything Elizabeth shares, we welcome that as well. But Elizabeth, go ahead. Thanks, Heyman. Um, So, candidly, I think there's two potential paths, right, depending on whether this proposed legislation is passed. The current path is the one that we're on and we're committed to continuing on, as I mentioned, our ongoing work with the forum. That is starting this conversation about identifying potential um, control sets and other sorts of uh, starting points, if you will, for looking at where you could develop minimum requirements. So that is a conversation that is in its early stages and I anticipate would drive a lot of the forum's work going into the next fiscal year. If this bill were to come to fruition and were to create this committee, um, this gets to the second part of your question. Then in that instance, what ONCD would be pursuing would be mandatory requirements. Um, that first path I alluded to, the one that we're on, is voluntary. And there's only so much that can be achieved voluntarily. Um, I think we all understand and accept that. And as some of my leadership in the office likes to say, government created this problem, government has to fix this problem. Um, and that would be the goal of this proposed committee as we understand the intent of uh, Senator Peters. And that would be, it would be mandatory. It would be mandatory requirements, but that is again, why it would be so crucial to have the independent regulatory commission scoped in with that. Because not only should they have a say, of course, in informing those requirements so that they're realistic for their sector, but then they're also the ones that have to go and enforce them because ONCD, of course, is, is not a regulator. Um, so that's how we see it going forward, um, depending on how things shake out in the next few months. That's super helpful. Thank you, Elizabeth. So relatedly, and Vince and Jay, if there's any follow-up comments or any responses you'd like to give to Elizabeth, feel free to fold it into this follow-up question that I have as well. But directed more towards Vince and Jay, are there any other additional recommendations or considerations that you would suggest to further support and enhance ongoing efforts to advance cybersecurity regulatory harmonization? I'll go ahead and turn to Vince first, and then we'll um, go to Jay after that. Sure, thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, one, I think we at the chamber really like the the pilot program that's proposed in the Peters Langford res um, uh, legislation as an opportunity for having real concrete like projects. And then the other part that I think was included as a manager's amendment to um, to to the draft bill pre markup. Um, included private sector inputs into um, what those pilot projects look like. I think that's a really important consultation process um, that could help drive and inform. Uh, so at the end of the day, someone's going to say, yeah, here's what we're going to do, and we're going to go forth and prosper on, on these initiatives. But I think a couple that, that we've seen this administration um, pick up um, on a national and international level offer a good model. Um, one is the Joint Cyber Safe Products Action Plan uh, between the US and EU, building off of the US Cyber uh, Trust Mark um, and the, US, uh, the EU's Cyber Resilience Act, which introduces new product level cybersecurity requirements for any new uh, internet connected um, uh, products entering the EU marketplace and you know, five plus years. Really important, like high level agreement between the US and Europe on what a mutual recognition program can look like, scoped of devices, baseline standards. That's a good initiative that is a like good exemplar of the work that we would like to see continue over, um, over the long term. A second one, also in the context of the U.S. relationship with the EU um, done by uh, the Department of Homeland Security um, and DHS policy and the European Union's DG Connect. And it was a comparative analysis on the various uh, approaches to incident reporting um, done through CERCIA and done through NIS2. That comparative analysis, that stock take, like that's the first one I think that we've seen 
um, where multiple different jurisdictions that have core reporter requirements get together and say, how does ours look? How does yours look? Like, let's identify these gaps and try and figure out like how we can create maybe not a perfect harmonized process, but at least a better process for reporting requirements uh, across borders to create a better operating picture for governments. I think those two exemplars offer like a good starting point, and I'm sure that there are others that we can build off of um, in the next next two years. Jay, whenever you're ready. Such smart comments here. I'm really enjoying this. Thanks. Um, Vince, let me ask you a question, though. Is there in the latest markup bill, is there a requirement for the executive branch to get back to Congress on how many regulations have been harmonized or report the results of what's happening within ONCD? Yes, I believe right. there is a report okay. to Congress. Good. At least one report. Good, because that's right. You know, um, uh, that, that strikes me as important. Like, what yeah. regulations are actually the most effective? Is, are we actually harmonizing these? I would love to know, like, which, you know, how we're prioritizing each of those. I'm also curious on how we're doing um, internationally. Um, we, I, I was at a great event um, the other day here in New York, and one of the senior leaders in supervision for the Fed was talking about when it was coming to finance of saying, well, we were gonna roll out rules on topic X. And, but we were waiting for what the FSB, the Financial Stability Board to, work, to, to move first. So that way we could make sure that we were, we were working with the, with the coordinated international position before we took our own step as US regulators. And I just, I was like, what a great regulatory moment to be hearing this from such a senior person at the Fed um, that they were going to wait on that. So I'll be curious as the bill makes its way forward on how we can do this internationally. Because right now, my, my instinct says it happens sector by sector, right? It's, it's happening, you know, good, the finance sector is doing that and maybe aviation is the, is the other kind of global, like inherently global um, sector. But I'll be curious in what we can do, both from the legislative branch and smart bills, as well as the executive branch, um, to be working with, because um, many of our important companies that are really um, bringing American products around the world and improving America's GDP are stuck because these regulations aren't harmonized um, across, across sectors, I mean, sorry, across, uh, across countries. And so we'll especially be looking forward to what ONCD and, and Congress can do on that. Thank you. Thank you, Jane Vince. So I wanted to wrap up our current discussion. I know there's so much more that we could obviously discuss. The hour really doesn't do it justice and we really just scratched the surface of it all. Um, but in interest of time, I do want to give you guys an opportunity. If you could, if the audience, if you could give the audience one takeaway in like a sentence or so from everything that we've discussed so far and maybe everything that they should anticipate, what might that be? And then after, you know, we go around the room here, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Q&A for one or two from the audience as well. So I'll go ahead and start, um, not to put you on the spot, Jay, but if we can go for, with you first, and then we'll go to um, Elizabeth and then Vince. Uh, this isn't where you want me to go, but I really want to compliment the work that ONCD and the Chamber have done, right? And and especially like to hear Vince talk about how they've gone around the world and talk about harmonization and and using things like NIST, and especially ONCD, right? And just thinking about the RFI that they've put out and just how that has substantially changed the discussion, or at least for me, right? To be able to go in and and see ANCD Lyserson in testimony. And not just say, here's what we think, or, or here's what we've heard others say in other places. But no, we went through the full process and we formally asked people to comment. And this is what we got back. To me, it, it absolutely changes the conversation about how we're going about this and shows, no, we are on the same path here, right? We are, you know, we might have slightly different opinions, but we all want the same kinds of goals here. And just my compliments. Elizabeth? Yeah, no, I think, um, thank you, Jay, for that. We always appreciate the support. It's, it's really meaningful to us, thank you. I think, you know, the takeaway, I probably already said it, right? But this idea that we understand government created this problem, government's job to fix it. And I think for better or for worse, the last, the events of the last, I don't know, a few 
couple weeks um, have really driven home this point. I think, for example, the CrowdStrike incident got a lot of attention from folks. If for no other reason, it illustrated what can happen when a technology is used across multiple sectors, right? And it kind of becomes a de facto single point of failure in many instances. And so there's a real opportunity here to have to move this conversation that we've been having at fits and starts over the last several years about cross-sector regulatory harmonization and into action. And as Vince mentioned, right, the potential of doing a pilot program to actually generate some meaningful outcomes and see how you can do it within a sector or a subsector and then extrapolate that out. I think there's a lot of potential here um, and hopefully good momentum to keep going. And in the interim, again, we really appreciate our partners at the FCC and within the forum who have come to it really open-minded and I think also recognizing the real challenge and the risk that's here with critical infrastructure and figuring out what is the sensible, practical approach that can meaningfully buy down risk in a way that, frankly, regulated entities can live with and that the regulators themselves can effectively supervise. Thanks, Elizabeth. And last but certainly not least, Vince. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks very much, you know, to, to everyone, to the panel for, for a great conversation. I really, I think, all singing from the same sheet of music, so appreciate that. Um, you know, three kind of like closing, quick closing thoughts. One, a deep appreciation to Elizabeth, to Nick, to the entire OECD um, team, for, for Jay, for, for all of those that had like the pen on, you know, government created this problem. Like we want to be a part of the solution, like genuine appreciation from the business community um, on behalf of creating like a coherent regulatory framework. So number one, thanks. Two, to, to those in industry and like, there's some great comments, questions that's ongoing in the, the chat that I'm trying to follow along on this tiny screen and really having a hard time doing the split screen, but there's some really good questions in there. And I think, you know, continue to provide that feedback back loop to the chamber, to your associations, to your SRMAs, to, to ONCD um, and, and others. I think they're like, get, help us get to granular level, like, help us understand precisely where the pain points are. I think in, in putting our um, comments together for ONCD, it was like levels of specificity, granularity are really, really helpful. So please do, you know, share those in writing, calls, texts, emails, like, you know, keep us informed, keep us up to date. The regulatory landscape, well, somewhat, you know, moves quickly. It does move slow um, at times as well. And then third, you know, Another ask to, to all stakeholders, you know, please encourage, continue to encourage um, peers, Langford supporters of um, their legislation to move, um, move Senate, the Senate towards um, uh, uh, full endorsement um, and approval of, of their act, and then also onto the House um, as well. So talking to Nancy Mace and her colleagues um, about the importance of cyber regulatory harmonization. We have a moment here. Let's not lose it, um, and let's keep the let's keep the uh, momentum going. Thank you so much, Vince, and also to Jay and Elizabeth. I think this discussion was really informative, and like I said, it really only scratches the surface, so I'm sure we'll be continuing the conversation for a long while here. So thank you as well to the audience for submitting all of these wonderful Q&As like Vince highlighted. Unfortunately, for time reasons, we won't be able to go through every single one, but I did want to pick one or two um, just to go over. So the first question from an audience member is, could each of you please provide with particularity, i.e. citing specific regulations? Regulations, the most egregious example of regulatory disharmonization that you believe to exist. Um, I'll open up the floor to any of you guys who are ready to chime in. I don't want to put anyone too on the spot, um, but I'll open up the floor and anyone is welcome to chime in on the spot. I'll pick on the SEC first and foremost. I think, you know, we like we, you know, broadly like the chamber and our members that we supported, we put our full, you know, advocacy behind the establishment of a national level incident reporting standard to be developed through a uh, consultative process that any stakeholders could contribute to, um, to be managed by CISA and to see like this, you know, to see an additional rule promulgated, like, come on, man, like, you know, this is one in which like this was easy for us to, to be preventable. I think seeing 
um, seeing like successive guidance published by the commission um, to follow up on the December implementation of the reporting requirements shows that some of the issues that the chamber raised early and often um, you know, did bear out um, into being problematic for public entities reporting to the commission. So I think that's one in which like, you know, most recent, most problematic, um, but happy to happy to come back on this as well. That's great. Thank you, Vince. Jay and Elizabeth, any follow on thoughts as well? Um, for for me, agreed. Just uh, you know, it, it was interesting as we were actually going through the the cybersecurity performance goals from CISA, and that were coming out of roughly the same time as similar controls for rail and pipeline. And it was just amazing to see. Remember, I talked about that framework about how you know micro ends means one thing and micro means is another, and to see these these controls which are coming out for ostensibly the same purpose, um, for um, for sectors that varied, but, you know, in, in their technology and in their risk profile, but maybe not that much. And you ended up with controls, all, you know, controls that were all over the place. And there was no reason for them to be arbitrary. And that's a word we haven't really used here is arbitrary. They're, they didn't need to be arbitrary. With a little bit more thought, with the right kind of framework beforehand, those could have been more aligned. I'm actually, I'm still not made up on my mind. I'm going to take the opposite point of this um, here. SEC has a has had for a long time. You've got four days report that's something material, and the whole rest of the sector might have said, "Hey, I mean, everyone else that needed reports might have said, you know what? What are the existing reports? Materiality is four days. SEC shouldn't change a new rule and break their harmonization of what you need to report to investors for a material impact, and it's the same rule for everybody." except for cyber, and there we're going to change the four days and we're going to make it three days because um, that's what Congress said was in Circea. If anything, I put that on Circea. Circea shouldn't have said seven, you've got 72 hours, right? That's micro, right? They might have said around 72 hours or the no, no, um, no longer than this period or no shorter than, um, and to give the regulating agencies more framework. That's especially important now with Loper Bright. That, that Congress, uh, that the Supreme Court has overthrown Chevron. We need to be making sure that the agencies have the authority they need to do things that make sense and mandating the 72 hours is what bro is to me, might has some blame for what happened with the with the difference between the train SEC, not just SEC itself. Yeah, fair, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that debate with you. I think we'd have the same conversation on like, substantial versus significance definitionally in Circea as well. Like we kind of made up a word in Circea yeah, yeah, around perfect, substantial. Perfect. And like, if we could do this back over again, like significance is one that has much more of a common lexicon that's understood. Yeah. Yeah. So, perfect. yeah. Great, last but not least, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, thank you gentlemen for raising the ever thorny and contentious issue of incident reporting. Um, if you saw our request for information, you'll know that we explicitly scoped that out. And it's not because we at ONCD don't recognize that that is a pain point for a lot of folks. It's because we did not want to get ahead of the CERC, the Cyber Incident Reporting Council, right? That's squarely within that. So we're mindful of it. I just, I give that disclaimer um, to folks. I think in terms of specific examples, candidly, I can't point you to one off the top of my head, but I will say that, for example, um, more broadly, uh, we heard from the transportation sector, which Jason or you Jay just alluded to in terms of rail and, and Vince alluded to with aviation. And it was really interesting to see their perspectives and how they interact with their multiple regulators. To take the aviation example, you know, they are dealing with both TSA in some instances, of course, because TSA has a remit for things within airports, but then also dealing with the FAA, who, of course, is in charge of the actual safety of the aircraft and whatnot in flight. And so hearing that view and hearing from some of the airline industry's representatives about the challenges they're facing there and are there opportunities to drive a more streamlined regulatory environment in that instance, 
Um, also, even more narrowly scoped, if you are an aircraft manufacturer and you produce for both civil and defense aviation, right? There are some discrepancies there as well. So that is perhaps a little more surgical of a view, um, not a specific, you know, I, I can't cite to the point in the U.S. code, but the idea that even within just one sector, right, there are some challenges if you're operating to say nothing of, I, I probably sound like a broken record, but again, we're really focused on the, the cross-sector risk issue. How do you address it even within one sector and then widen the aperture across sectors? Hopefully can, that's helpful. <laughs> can I just build on two points? Because the two things you said I think are really important. Disharmony itself isn't bad. Disharmony itself can lead to tailoring, right? If, you say, if we say we want tailored um, uh, because one sector has a different risk profile than another, that's a disharmony, but it's a disharmony that we say is good, right? We want that. We want more of those kinds of disharmonies and fewer that are arbitrary. And what I really liked what you said about reporting, right? Harmonized regulations comes from patients, right? It comes from the Fed supervision saying, we're gonna wait for the FSB. It comes from you saying, we're not gonna work on reporting right now. We're gonna let the interagency process work this out. Crises delivers fast response, right? Um, but it doesn't deliver harmonization. And so for people listening that might not be used to government processes, that was really important what was Elizabeth said. We're gonna wait, we're gonna let the interagency process work. That's how we get harmonization through patience and letting the process come together. Thank you so much. Um, in the interest of time, although I'd love to continue this conversation for probably another hour or however long it takes to really flesh out all the details, I do want to wrap us up for today. Um, again, a huge thank you to Elizabeth, Jay, and Vince for all of the excellent insights and perspectives that you each shared. We look forward to staying engaged with you all. And thank you as well to the audience for tuning in and for all of the excellent questions you submitted. Again, as all of the panelists and Vince specifically encourage, continue to stay engaged with these issues, and we look forward to continuing this discussion as well. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.